यूट्यूबर्स पे गए लाइव कैमरा खर्च बंद माइक हेलो हेलो
Warm welcome to all of you. Today, we have a special guest from IIT Kanpur, Dr. Jandan Rao, who is currently SAD there. And he has been many laurels to his institute. He is currently working in the field of gene therapy. And uh, he's running many external funding projects, um, mostly from the DBT Cold Search Grant, uh, uh, Welcome Fellowship Trust, he has got two projects uh, worth uh, 20 crores and he has recently been um, a big laurel to his institute by uh, having collaboration with uh, in a big company around about 100 crores so i think uh, let me uh, invite the guest to speak much more about his work and other things well, welcome to you sir Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Dr. Shauki, for that gracious introduction. Um, and my apologies for starting a little late, uh, uh, by the way. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you over the next half an hour or so is our efforts to bring in gene therapy to the masses, right? So before I start, I would like to ask the students here. I'm sure that we have PhD students, bachelor's and master's students. How many of you have heard the term gene therapy? Majority. How many of you will think uh, in the next five to 10 years, this can become a standard of care? How many of you think this will become a standard of care? Anybody? OK, I'll ask the same question again at the end of my talk. And let us say if you have learned something from this and you give me the answer, there. is that OK? OK, and please feel free to stop me at any point of time uh, with your questions. I'll be happy to answer even in between the presentation, right? OK, the term gene therapy in general refers to the introduction of a normal copy of the gene into a patient with a genetic disorder. You must have heard multiple genetic disorders, hemophilia, it's a bleeding disorder. Then there is congenital blindness, people are born with deficiency in certain visual cycle proteins. So they present with basically uh, retinitis pigmentosa and similar diseases. So there are multiple human genetic disorders, right? And what do these patients lack? They lack a very specific protein, which is responsible for a given function. And when they lack this, they can be blind, they can be hemophiliac, depending on which gene is involved. But the concept of gene therapy is very simple. What you do is you take a normal copy of that gene, which is lacking in the patient. Then you administer them into the patients, expecting that this normal copies of the gene will produce a protein which was lacking in the patient. And therefore, it can reconstitute the phenotype or the function. That's the basic idea behind gene therapy. But the most crucial part of doing gene therapy is to have good vehicles or vectors that will carry these normal gene copies into a specific tissue into a patient, right? That's the most important component of gene therapy. And of course, some of you may have heard there are different vehicles to take these normal copies of these genes. There are virus-based vectors. We call them as vectors, right? There are virus-based vectors and there are non-viral vectors. Now, we and typically my lab uses virus-based vectors. This is simply because 
viruses have evolved over several thousands of years to infect specific tissues in the humans. And therefore, what you are doing is you are exploiting their property to carry this genetic cargo into a specific tissue in the human body, right? And there are multiple virus vectors like lentiviruses, retroviruses. And my lab in particular works on a virus called adeno-associated virus. I will be abbreviating this as AAV, right? AAV was first discovered in 1965 as contaminants of uh, adenoviral culture. The virus is very simplistic. It contains two genes. One is the rep gene that encodes for the replication dependent function of the virus. And the second is called as a cap gene, which encodes for this icosahedral capsule. And this is flanked by a very typical element called as inverted terminal repeat on both sides. And it is one of the smallest known viruses, about 20 nanometers in diameter. And the biggest advantage of this virus as a gene therapy vector is its non-pathogenic nature. So far, no human disease has been associated with AAV. And when you're talking about gene therapy, safety is of paramount importance. In a country where you know uh, there can be uh, challenges with respect to genetically modified organisms and their usages, it is important to subscribe to safe delivery systems. And that is where this goes majorly. And what we do is we take this virus, you add your normal copy of your gene of interest into this entire shell protein, right? So the wild type viral genes, the rep and cap are taken away. Instead, you substitute with your gene of interest, which is your normal copy of the gene. And then you use the rest of the viral elements so that you are basically using this as a Trojan horse to deliver your intended genetic cargo to a specific tissue of interest in the human being. There are at least 10 common serotypes of AAV that are very well known and used in the field. And these are named from AAV 1 to 10. And broadly, you have at least one AAV serotype to target major organ systems in the human body. I'll give you an example. If let's say you are going to work on a disease that affects the liver, right? And you want to deliver a normal copy of the gene to the liver. So then I need to have hepatotrophic virus, which has an affinity towards the hepatocytes. AAV2 and AAV8 in general are known to be hepatotrophic. So I will use this serotype to put my genetic cargo and then deliver it to the patients or animal models, whichever system I'm working on. So of course, all of these 10 serotypes have been widely used in majority of preclinical models and even in some of the phase one, two, three clinical trials. And while in preclinical models, AAV based gene therapy has been largely curative, when it comes to patients, there are some learnings that we have seen in the field. The first and foremost is the long term efficacy. You are delivering this to a patient, there is a spurt in terms of protein response, but then it falls back after one or two years after gene transfer. And that is one aspect. The second aspect is you will be actually loading the patients with a huge load of virus, a huge exogenous protein load. You know it leads to immune response. And this is another major concern because once the immune system has recognized something as foreign, no matter what you do, when you re-administer the same protein, it is going to mount an immune response. And that's the principle of your vaccination, right? And then the third and more local component, which is important is each one of this drug that is approved currently by FDA. I'll just give you examples. There are five to six uh, gene therapy products that are approved by the US FDA. The general cost is about 1 million US dollars for one dose to up to 3.8 million US dollars for one dose. Now, that's beyond the reach of many of us, uh, you know, and therefore it becomes our prerogative. How can we make this accessible to the patients? and as you are talking about genetic disorder, 80% of the, these patients live in lower and middle income countries. I have abbreviated that as LMIC. And therefore, that is another goal that we have in terms of making it accessible globally. I'll probably give you a few examples of our work that we have done in preclinical models. I must admit here, we have not moved on to clinical trials. It is all in the planning stage. 
but i'll give you some brief about our work in hemophilia as well as in leber congenital amaurosis which is a ocular disease if time permits i'll show you one model of cancer that we have worked on majority of you have heard about hemophilia what is it it's a bleeding disorder now how does this happen let's assume that you are sharpening a pencil with a blade i do not know how many of you still do that we used to do that in the 90s right you cut your finger what do you see there there is bleeding but the bleeding stops after some time how does it stop clotting factors generally how much time does it take to stop five to so the lower range is between four to five minutes you are absolutely right and why does it stop and the reason is as soon as you have a vascular breach right the vessel size constricts this is called as vasoconstriction and vasoconstriction is sensed by the change in uh sub endothelial uh, uh vascular uh, uh mediator so i'll not get into the molecular details so once this vasculature constricts there is a reduced blood flow or a blood loss then you have circulating cells in the blood called as platelets and platelets can actually take any shape that they want therefore these platelets form a loose platelet plug by a process known as adhesion and aggregation so they form a tight matrix there so they will further arrest the blood flow but this is not completely enough to arrest the bleeding and therefore you have what is called as this clotting cascade or the clotting factors which will actually assemble on the surface of an activated platelet and it's a sequence of multiple uh, coagulation factors that forms the five fi uh, final fibrin clot i'll not get into the details the final objective of this clotting cascade is to form the fibrin once the fibrin forms it's like a meshwork which brings together the platelets so in the meanwhile while this is happening maybe we should discuss a little bit more so what happens is when you have this fibrin clot the bleeding arrest completely now what happens is the coagulation factors that are involved in this entire process is so crucial uh, that any lack of that protein is going to compromise on the final clotting product which is the fibrin right and hemophilia is a disease I think some of you may have some of you may have joined a little later. Uh, I had just given a brief of uh, gene therapy, and we were going through some of the disease models uh, that I was going to describe. So, as I was talking to you earlier, uh, see the final objective of the clotting cascade is to form the stable fibrin clot. Now, when you have a deficiency of any one of these proteins, this is going to compromise on the fibrin formation and therefore leading to a bleeding phenotype. And hemophilia in particular results from the lack of two major clotting factors called as coagulation factor 8 and coagulation factor 9. Factor 8 deficiency leads to hemophilia A and factor A deficiency leads to hemophilia B. Well done. So this is what happens. So you have a vascular injury. There is a certain amount of platelet plug that is formed, but because of lack of fibrin, it particularly in hemophiliacs, it leads to spontaneous bleeding, particularly in patients who have severe hemophilia or less than 1% of the normal clotting activity. 
they have spontaneous musculoskeletal bleeds and that is dangerous the reason is if you have a factor level of less than one person or i have a factor level of less than one person i can have a ic bleed intra uh, cranial bleed and i can collapse because this is spontaneous and patients with severe hemophilia who have less than one percent of factor eight or nine clotting activity typically have these symptoms then you have depending on the uh, residual level of coagulation factor level patients are characterized as either moderate mild or of course this is the normal end of the spectrum and the biggest advantage here is that you know relative advantage here is that mild and moderate hemophilia are only post traumatic bleeders meaning only when they have an injury they will bleed they are not typically spontaneous bleeders so of course you can also give them recombinant protein replacement therapy so there are commercial products available to deliver human coagulation factor 8 and 9 but that would cost upwards of 70 to 80 lakhs per year on prophylaxis and that is again a massive investment but the major problem is compliance these patients have to go to the hospital at least twice or thrice a week to receive these coagulation factors and that means the quality of life is compromised right and uh, gene therapy is curative because you are potentially delivering a normal copy of the factor 9 gene and with one administration the hope is the patient gets cured for their lifetime this is a very simplistic way of putting it right but of course there are uh, multiple uh, uh, aspects to that uh, which needs to be taken care of and of course multiple human clinical trials have been used for hemophilia gene therapy and uh, for example pfizer and biomarin have worked on very specific factor 8 or factor 9 coagulation factors and they have used the av based system while they produce certain level of normal physiological response in patients the major problem as i said is uh, in terms of the cost and the cost is largely driven by their r and d uh, investments now this is just an example of how biomarin is looking at their pricing strategy two to three million dollars uh, per dose uh, in terms of uh, availability to patients. So the first disease I have given you a glimpse of is hemophilia. The second disease I want to talk to you before we start with what we are doing is Leber congenital amaurosis, right? Now you are seeing me and I'm looking at you. It is because there is an active visual cycle that is going on. So the incident light is converted into uh, electrical signal inputs into the brain and there is a whole lot of molecular and cellular factors that are involved and crucial to this aspect of the visual cycle is the uh, activity of photoreceptors which are rods and cones which remains tethered to a layer innermost layer of the retina called as a retinal pigmental epithelial cell right this is the innermost layer of the retina so this is what is depicted here this is your rpe cells these are the depiction of the photoreceptors I want you to focus on only this aspect. There is an uh, enzyme uh, called as RPE65. It is an isomerase that is responsible for conversion of this substrate, all trans retinal esters, to Levensis retinal. Levensis retinal then co combines with opsin, which is what basically transmits your uh, visual signals. Now, when you have a mutation in this RPE65 gene, of course, the substrate, all trans retinal esters, cannot be converted. And because the substrate is an ester, they get accumulated within the RPE layer, layer. And whenever you have an ester accumulating in a cellular compartment, it results in cellular apoptosis, right? And this means the photoreceptors can no longer bind to the innermost layer of the retina, and therefore your vision is compromised. And this typically happens within the first two years of life. And that is because these patients have a mutation in the gene called as RPE65, right? And of course, a variety of clinical trials have happened even uh, for RPE65 deficiency. To cut a long story short, they have all used AAV-based vector systems. The peak visual gain or the response was 1.5 years after gene therapy, but thereafter, because of either neutralizing antibody formation, a decline in RPE65 gene expression, the patients come back to the baseline meaning the gene therapy is effective for a transient phase, but it comes back to the baseline, which they started with. So the whole idea here is, in the field, how would you develop an ideal vehicle for gene therapy that has some crucial points? The first point is, with the lowest dose of vector possible, how can you get maximum efficiency? So that is normal to expect, right? 
The second aspect is when you give it to patients, we have already seen in the clinical trials that immune response plays a major role. So how do you reduce the immunogenicity of these viral vector systems? That's the second point. And one of the crucial things that you have to know is, let's say there are about 40 people in this room and close to 70 to 80 percent will be zero positive against AAB because this is naturally occurring. And which means if you have a zero positive individual, they typically cannot be part of a gene therapy trial because they will be under the exclusion criteria. The moment I'm administering an AAV based vector system systemically for a systemic disorder, uh, it's going, the neutralizing antibodies are going to neutralize the incoming viruses. And therefore, can you develop a virus which is effective, which is less immunogenic? Can you also have something that you can give to a patient who already is seropositive to AV? These are the major holy grails or the requirements of an ideal gene therapy vector. And of course, the other impact that it has to have is it has to be less expensive, right? That is another goal that we have. Just to give you a background, these gene therapy products typically were developed in major universities in the United States, in the academia. Then it got translated into multiple companies that are working on this. I told you Pfizer trial, Biomarit trial, and so on and so forth. But that requires a significant requirement uh, in terms of R&D, the know-how, because you need, at the end of the day, it all boils down to what kind of technical uh, knowledge that uh, the uh, human resource that we have, right? So the know-how is limited and competence generally is rare. And uh, there is also a regulatory framework that is required because, you know, gene therapy is something. And therefore, any country that is attempting gene therapy also should have regulations which are put together, right? In terms of lower and middle income countries, uh, in developing countries, gene therapy product development and patents are very limited. And that adds to the cost because you have to buy something from somewhere you cannot reduce the cost and therefore you have to develop yourself. Then the other aspect is production of these vectors. See, you can do a lot of trials at the preclinical stage, but if you have to administer to your patient, they have to be produced in clinical grade, good manufacturing practice uh, conditions. And only then the uh, uh, regulatory agencies will give you approval to start your clinical trials. So you're all professional, so you understand this part. And then of course, uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of initiative that needs to be done to make it uh, available to 70% of the population where it is technically not even marketed as of now, right? So what is our initiative? We start from the host virus biology. When a typical virus infects, it has to bind to the cell surface. It gets internalized. Then there is a process called as cytoplasmic trafficking. It enters into the nucleus and then it delivers the cargo. In this case, because it's a gene therapy cargo, it will give you the normal copies of the gene. But in this processes, you can have multiple host responses, correct? For example, um, if a virus enters into a, the cytoplasm, the cell sees a huge load of exogenous viruses or uh, uh, proteins, it's going to mount an immune response. It's going to destroy some of the capsid proteins and they're going to present them to MHC class two or class one, depending on what kind of response is needed. And therefore there will be a T cell or B cell response subsequently, right? Now, what it means is um, if you identify these triggers and if you develop strategies to overcome them, then you are in a good shape, correct? And this is what we are trying to do. Trying to understand the virus host biology at each one of these levels. So we understand the critical points where the host mounts an immune response or is able to decrease the transduction efficiency of the virus and then develop strategies to overcome them. Okay, we have a strategy, we have an idea. Then we test them in animal models. We have animal models of hemophilia, we have animal models of cancer, ocular uh, disorders, muscular dystrophy, so on and so forth. And then we use a variety of methods for gene transfer, including in vivo hepatic gene transfer, uh, ocular gene transfer, so on and so forth. And let me start with one of the first projects that we started, and this is called as capsid bioengineering. I've just talked to you that there are multiple steps when the viruses enters into your host cell, right? Now, AAV binds to the cell surface. It enters into the cytoplasm. Now, you see a huge dose of viruses coming. In. Now, this host responds. Uh, how does it respond? It sees this virus. 
you have cellular serine threonine kinases. What do you mean by a kinase? An enzyme that phosphorylates. And these are there for other purposes. You have a huge load of virus coming in. So we identified that there are serine threonine kinases, which specifically recognize motifs on the viral capsid. And they recognize serine threonine residues, of course. And they phosphorylate these residues. Now, this phosphorylation serves as the trigger for ubiquitination of the viral capsid. So what happens when a protein gets ubiquitinated? It gets degraded by proteasome uh, system, right? So what it means is if I use 100 viruses against a single cell, at least 70 are targeted for phosphorylation and ubiquitin mediated degradation. That mounts an immune response. This is a very simplistic uh, description. And only 30 make it to the nucleus, which in effect, you get the protein produce only from these 30 copies, right? So this is a big waste of resources. So our idea is to identify initially when we started off this, what were those residues on the viral capsid that were specifically phosphorylated or ubiquitinated? And for this, uh, we started interacting with my first collaborator, in, in fact, Professor Ren Srinivasan, he's no more. He belongs to Molecular Biophysics Unit in IASC. We started interacting with him in 2011. And he helped us identify what is called as phosphodegrons on the viral capsid. What do you mean by a phosphodegron? A phosphodegron is nothing but a cluster of serine, threonine, and lysine residues. As you know, serine, threonine are the for, uh, substrate for kind activity, and the lysines are substrates for ubiquitination, right? And we identified three such phosphodegrons on AAV2 capsid, which is the conventional capsid that is used in gene therapy. And once we identified them, then our next question was, can we mutate residues of these phosphodegrons or in and around these phosphodegrons? And if we do that, can we reduce the ubiquitination? And when you reduce ubiquitination, and therefore the gene transfer efficiency will be more, and immune response should not be a major concern. That's a simple idea that we had. And how did we do this? We created a huge bunch of mutants of AAV2 viral capsid. I'll be going a little fast because now I'm talking about data and I'll just give you a synapse of each one of this, synopsis of each one of these slides. And if you see here, this is HeLa cells. This is unmodified AAV2 virus. These are some of the modified lysine mutants that we developed. You can straight away see there is a threefold degree GFP expression, which is a marker protein. And of course, we did a gene transfer into animals and this is by hepatic gene transfer and we saw two to four fold increase in gene expression in the liver of mice that had received some of these mutant vectors. So this is with the conventional AAV2 vector, right? Now, the problem with AAV2, at least when you do a systemic gene transfer, when you administer them intravenously, 80% of humans are seropositive. So the question was, can we apply the same philosophy in another capsid and what would be the effect? And at that time, there were two published papers that had used AVC age serotype. And this was a trial from University College London. So we first targeted AV8 capsid. And the majority of these sites that we chose for mutagenesis were conserved across multiple AV serotypes, which means now potentially I could improve the gene transfer efficiency into the liver. Or I can take AV5, which is good in terms of gene transfer into the lungs. And I can use that potentially as a platform technology to deliver it into the lungs as well. Okay, this was a starting point. So of course, this was a major exercise. Just to give you a snapshot of some of the data, this is the wild type AAV8 after administration of the uh, AAV8 wild type capsid with luciferase. Uh, you can see a localization to the liver of the luciferase activity. And you can see some of these mutants that we developed typically gave two to three fold increase intrahepatic gene transfer. Believe me, this is only with the reported genes, right? So then we had to show, okay, with the reported genes, this happens this way, whether you use GFP or you use luciferase, what happens with the therapeutic gene? So that is when we collaborated with Professor Amit Nathwani, who was leading the clinical trial at that time in the uh, United Kingdom. And he was gracious enough to share his uh, construct, which was uh, a liver specific human factor. Nine. And this is the level of factor nine that you see in uh, animals uh, with hemophilia. We have animal transgenic animals of hemophilia. And when we administer, you get roughly this levels of factor nine activity with the mutant capsids. You can see near physiological levels of factor nine that was generated. Now, 
what I have shown you so far is the concept of viral capsid. And then I told you we took one approach, which is capsid bioengineering. I've given you an example of serine threonine residues, lysine residues, which are modified. And then I showed you with either GFP or luciferase, you see an increased liver gene transfer efficiency. And with the therapeutic gene in a hemophilia B mice model, we can see therapeutic gene transfer, right? Any questions up to this point of time? Yes. Excellent question. So uh, it has happened, and uh, I'll give you. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that is important is. When we start any mutagenesis studies, it's like a base of a pyramid. We use multiple combinations. And we have seen generally, whatever mutagenesis that we do, only 30% of that typically work. And the reason for that is, one is the mutant can lead to loss of confirmation. Why loss of confirmation? It's a single amino acid residue, right? But this is an icosahedral capsid, which is made up of 60 monomers of the capsid protein. So even if I make a single mutation on one of the monomer, typically on the surface, it is reflected 60 different times right and therefore it can destabilize the capsid depending on where the residue is that is number one but what we do is we use a very simple algorithm when i start with 10 mutants for example but my first cutoff is can i can these mutants when i package them into lab condition their titers the production titers should not fall below the wild type titers the moment it does even if it works fantastically well i cannot scale it to, uh, to the patients right and your answer is uh, your question was right we do find this that is why we start with a huge base and then we narrow down with the base of the pyramid like equal or above titers with respect to wild type in terms of functional effect it has to be better than the wild type and the immune response has to be equal or lesser than the uh, wild type capsids that we use so we use a very strategic approach there that has happened in the lab and it's possible that it has happened it is possible. The only issue here is we are going to work with these 10 serotypes that I have asked you. We have had a separate project isolating natural variants, but they, they require a lot of characterization. And because we are looking at the transla uh, translational impact of these gene therapy products, the discovery mode is going on simultaneously, whereas we are focusing on what is available with us right away so that we can move this to clinical trials as soon as possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Right. So now that, uh, so I have talked about this. Now we have done this similar post-translational modifications, uh, even during viral packaging. I will not labor over this point. I'm just going fast because now we have got the message of what we are trying to do in terms of capsid engineering. Then we worked on what is called as nedulation and sumoylation mutants that can work on the viral capsid. We have worked that on AAV2 serotype with the intent to take it both to hemophilia as well as ocular gene therapy disorders, right? And uh, 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 majority of these mutants that we have developed uh, basically show an immune response. The T cell and B cell response are similar to wild type capsids. And this is one of our requirements to kind of uh, move it to the next phase. So what is the summary, uh, summary here? When we initiated the work, the hepatic gene transfer of the phosphodegron mutants and also the nedulation and sumolation uh, vectors that we have developed at least in hemophilia models, we were able to show that it produces therapeutic levels of the missing protein. In this case, because it's hemophilia B, it's a factor IX protein, correct? So the obvious question was, can you apply these vectors to other diseases as well? And what was the other disease that we worked on? Leber congenital amaurosis. I've already given you an introduction about that. And again, I will cut down on the details. I'll tell you, we have a mouse model of retinal degeneration which lacks rp65 right so the first question was these mutants that you have developed the nedulation and sumoylation mutants 
what is their performance in the eye? What we demonstrated was in the liver in terms of the factor nine assays. But you also have to visually see what happens in the eye. So this is after intravitreal gene transfer. This is a wild type AAV2 capsid that contains GFP. This is the basal level of expression that you see there. And with some of the mutants that we have developed, you clearly see a four to eight fold increase in terms of gene expression, right? And this is because they were able to avoid ubiquitination. I've actually masked a lot of biochemical and other immunological assays that we do for the intent of only showing you the primary data. And with this, arm um, with this, then the question was, what will happen if you deliver normal copy of the RP65 gene into your mice that cannot see, correct? And this is the ERG analysis from a mice that has been transduced with this modified vectors containing RP65. You know electroretinogram, I suppose most of you know. It produces a A wave and B wave that signifies the photoreceptor response and the inner uh, ganglion cell response in response to light that is shown uh, on their eyes, right? And this is the electrical signals that is acquired by a standard equipment. And in untreated mice, which has this congenital blindness, even when you shine high amplitudes of light, you don't see a response at all. With the wild type AAV2 vectors containing a normal copy of the RP65 gene, this is the level of uh, A wave and B wave response that you see. But with the modified vectors that we have, you can see clearly the A wave response and B wave response is quite pronounced. And I have not given you the comparison with wild type mice. It looks almost similar to the wild type mice. What it means is the mice, which were congenitally deficient, when you administer a mutated version of the capsid with RP65 gene, it is able to bring back the visual function. Correct? This is what we had done. Now, what I had shown you is the ability of these viruses, which are modified both in terms of hemophilia as well as in terms of uh, ocular disorder. Then there was a question. So there, uh, of course, uh, uh, sorry, I jumped a few slides. OK, here we were, right? OK, at this time, there was also multiple papers on exosomes. What are exosomes? Have you heard about exosomes? Have you done cell culture? Right? And when you cultivate any of the cell lines that you have used, obviously, you are going to put a growth media. Right? And these cells divide over 24 hours or 48 hours, depending on which cell line that you use. But these cells also release what is called as micro vesicles right exosomes are a type of vesiculated structures and they typically resemble the parent cell line so we use a human cell line to produce these viruses and when we make these viruses we throw away the spent medium take only the cellular fraction break open the cells and take the package viruses to do all the gene transfer studies that we have shown but there were reports that these micro vesicles may also carry viral particles during the production phase, which we are typically throwing it away, right? So the question was, how will, will these viruses work? So we took these exosomes and did an ocular gene transfer. You can clearly see that this is like day and uh, uh, night, that there is a massive gene transfer efficiency with the exosome fractions that were obtained after ultracentrifugation. And of course, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is a project that is currently ongoing. We are now packaging therapeutic genes into these exosomes uh, that contains these viruses so that we add value to the spent media, which is otherwise thrown out. Correct? So that we can reduce the cost. So what I have shown you so far is in vitro designing of novel capsids, testing them in hemophilia B models in terms of ocular gene transfer in RD12 deficient mice and then showed a phenotypic response. Do we have time so that I can show you some work on gene therapy, Dr. Shokin? We have some time. Can I proceed? Can I have some more time to finish this? OK. OK, so far what I have shown you is replacement gene therapy. What is replacement gene therapy? There is a defect. You are adding normal copy of the gene. Normal copy will produce certain amount of protein. It does its function. 
the next approach that we have taken is suicide gene therapy. What is suicide gene therapy? Here, the intent is to kill the target cells. Why? Because the target cells are not normal cells, like ocular cells or liver cells. Here, they are cancerous. Correct. So obviously, when you want to treat cancer with a small molecule or with a drug or a monoclonal antibody, it is always with the intention of moving those cells towards apoptosis or killing those cells, tumor cells, right? And how do we do this? Is we use a very specific suicide gene called as inducible caspase 9. Now, caspases are nothing but a series of enzymes that play a major role in terms of cellular apoptosis, right? And this inducible caspase 9 was previously described for uh, T cell uh, based CAR T cell therapy before, right? We just applied it for gene therapy in terms of hepatocellular carcinoma. And why hepatocellular carcinoma? It is one of the most common disorders, right? And uh, virtually uh, the only pharmacological intervention can actually uh, reduce the progression of the disease if you, if you detect them at early stages. But if surgical dissection is not possible, typically it becomes terminal, right? And therefore, we use this viral capsid and deliver this inducible caspase 9. So you may ask me, how does this inducible caspase 9 work? So this, when we deliver it in a genetic form, it, co it encodes for a fusion protein of caspase 9 and FKBP12 protein, which is fused here. And then when you add a small molecule, it is called as chemical inducer of dimerization or AP20187. Forget about the technical jargon. All you have is you have a caspase 9, you add a drug. When you add this drug, this monomers will dimerize. And only dimerized caspases can progress towards apoptosis. It's a cellular regulatory mechanism, right? So you deliver these viruses, which are hepatotropic. You administer them intravenously. You know 90% of the viruses will land in the liver. Then you administer this small molecule called as AP20187, which helps in dimerization of the inducible caspase. And whichever cell is infected with AAV will move towards apoptosis. That's a simple logic that we used. And again, in the interest of time, I will make sure uh, I'll just give you a uh, synopsis of these slides. You can see that upon administration of inducible caspase 9, there is a significant reduction in tumor volume. But I must also admit this is a work in progress. You don't see a complete ablation of that tumor. And that is simply because the cancer cells are extremely smart. They divide far more than the amount of viruses. It also shows that the virus has not been able to infect all tumor cells. Right? And that is a limitation that we have to live with. And these are some of the uh, uh, biochemical assays showing the uh, uh, apoptosis in terms of uh, caspase received mouse uh, tumor tissues. And uh, at the end of this, what we showed was AV mediated suicide gene therapy it, at the pilot level is able to show some level of phenotypic rescue. We are working on improvising the performance of these vectors at multiple levels. Maybe in my next talk here, or when you come to IIT Kanpur, I'll show you more data. But what I can tell you is uh, cancer is not an easy target. And our best bet is this can be combined with a conventional chemotherapy, but at reduced dose, so that you don't have adverse effects associated with uh, the uh, classical chemotherapy. And therefore, you give this as a combination uh, therapy in cancer patients to achieve durable remission in patients. OK. Uh, again, I've cut short a lot of data here just to convey the message. So where are we with respect to all of these AAV-based technologies? I've given you some examples in terms of hemophilia, liver congenital amaurosis, and uh, HCC. What we have worked on is also in preclinical models of acute myeloid leukemia, which you know is a defect that affects the hematopoietic stem cell compartment, particularly the lymphocyte maturation. And uh, we have shown that uh, the inducible caspase 9 works uh, very well there. And recently, we have also initiated studies on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. One in 3,500 boys have DMD. It's an X-linked disorder. It's a major cause for uh, 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 morbidity and mortality in young adults. And therefore, this is something that we have developed. We have not published it, but we have got excellent progress on that as well. And what we do is, while we are developing all of these things, these are also some of the original ideas which we created in the process of showing its efficacy or safety in preclinical models. And uh, why is it important is because then 
we can indigenize the vector production, right? And this is where we have recently partnered uh, with our commercial partners, and uh, I'm thankful to them, both Reliance Life Sciences as well as uh, Loris Labs, uh, who will be helping us in taking this technology to the commercial scale after uh, pursuing certain clinical trials, which are uh, very imminent. And uh, what are we looking for? I told you, uh, Luxterna is a gene therapy product, $750,000 per uh, dose. Zolzensma is for spinal muscular atrophy, $2 million. And just last week, we got an announcement that hemophilia product would be $3.8 million. And um, I don't think I can afford it. Uh, it's the same thing for many. So, uh, which means uh, we have also a social responsibility as people who receive public funding to make sure that these go to the patients at a cost which is affordable to them. And that is where we are progressing. And uh, as part of our work, uh, we also see that the concentration of these technologies is largely limited to the mainland United States as well as the uh, Western Europe. And uh, one of the key things that I'm also involved is with the American Society of Gene, Cell and, Gene and Cell Therapy, where I chair one of their committees. And we are taking this, uh, both the knowledge as well as the know-how to multiple countries uh, in South America, South Africa, as well as uh, recently we had a program in uh, um, Tanzania. And, uh, and uh, we have also helped the government of India to formulate the national guidelines for gene and cell therapy in India, which was released in 2019. And uh, of course, these are some of the outreach uh, efforts. So uh, I do not know how much you understood, but this part I'm sure that you will understand, right? How many of you like cricket? Should I ask the question other way around? How many of you do not like cricket? Does anybody not like cricket? Say I'm only interested in studies. No, right? None of us. It should not be that way. Uh, you know who is this person? Difficult? Sachin Tendulkar? Some of you like Sachin Tendulkar at least? Little bit, okay. Do you know when he was born? Not that level, right? 1973. In April, when he was born, uh, gene therapy was still a concept. So much so that a law journal actually talked about gene therapy and its impact uh, to the populace, right? 1973. And do you know when Sachin Tendulkar made his debut? Of course, before most of you were born, except for the faculty here. I suppose, uh, 19? 1989, to be precise. Uh, and uh, this was a test match. Uh, 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 and uh, when he debuted, Michael Bleese and colleagues at the NIH launched the first gene therapy trial for a condition called as severe combined immunodeficiency. These are patients who are born with defective function of T e cells and B cells. They were prone to infectious diseases and typically, uh, you know, it would become uh, uh, extremely difficult for them to survive beyond the first three to five years of life. And uh, you must have seen this picture of a bubble bird, baby, you know, uh, in case you Google it, you will, it will be available. This is 1999. Uh, and uh, this was the Cricket World Cup. When did it happen? Uh, I mean, where did it happen? Background tells you something. It happened in the England and Wales, right? At that point of time, Sachin Tendulkar, if you remember, lost his father. And, um, you know, so he had to fly back to Mumbai, finish, and the next day he came back and scored a century against Kenya. And he dedicated this to his father. And uh, what I wanted to mention you here is 99 typically was also a bad year for gene therapy because there was a patient called as Jesse Gilsinger. And uh, he had suffered from a condition called as ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, or OTC. And they had given uh, retroviruses. And basically, the patient died because of gene therapy. And US FDA put all the trials worldwide on hold. OK? So you are with me until now? 1973? 1989? 1999, right? There we were. And 2011, India won the World Cup, one day edition of the World Cup. And uh, you can see that, you know, people carrying in 
in 2011 and 2011 it was also victorious for in some sense or the other for gene therapy i was talking to you about amit natwani and colleagues at the ucl they published their first paper gene therapy paper in uh, new england journal of medicine in 2011 showing the efficiency of av8 vectors for gene therapy of hemophilia b this is a, i must admit this is against such interpreter and uh, he had a new hairdo but he retired in 2013 two years after the world cup right and uh, of course when he retired the ema european medicines agency brought in the first av5 based gene therapy for a condition called as lipoprotein lipase deficiency and this was launched as unicure within the european union right so we have finished 99 we have finished 2011 we are at 2013 10 years behind us now the next star uh, of at least indian cricket and who is this oh, how many of you do not like him okay i should not ask this question how many of you like him many right of course when virat kohli 2017 was a special year because he scored multiple centuries in all formats of cricket and for two consecutive years and that is when luxterna which is a gene therapy product for the rp65 deficiency was launched by spark therapeutics so we have come up to 2017 of course now times have changed and we are in 2023 new stars in the making for uh, uh, the cricket team and uh, what i suppose is some of you will take uh, some interest in gene therapy and you will become stars of the future so that you make it as a standard of care so i would like to thank all my members of the present and the past members of the lab collaborators and funding agencies for their help and support and thank you for your attention i'll be happy to see i have done most of the talking this is the bad part about a lecture because one talks the other listen so i would like to listen from you now i will ask the first question how many of you think that gene therapy can be a real possibility in the next 5 to 10 years this is the first question i started with so how many of you think in in the world and uh, in india you will see this as a reality in the next 10 years it's already there in the world in, in india there's a hope right uh, that's what keeps us going right yeah i'll be happy to take any questions so what are the reasons that the us virus are most important the biggest it's more of a legacy reason and uh, the legacy is that among the different viruses that have been used whether it is retro lenty there are safer versions of this adeno associated viruses are non integrating viruses what it means is they remain episomal if i have a target cell i use an av the nuclear material never integrates into the host cell nucleus they remain as episomal which means that any genotoxicity complication is straight away removed most of the other viruses that are used in the field are integrating viruses which means it can alter the genetic signature right that's an advantage but there's a disadvantage to this as well if i have a non integrating virus i cannot use that as a therapeutic molecule to a compartment which is actively dividing like hematopoietic stem cells if i want to have a gene correction for sickle cell disease which is a defect of the globin locus then i have to correct this in hscs but adeno associated viruses are non integrating with every division there will be a dilution of virus that is present in the cell and therefore this becomes a disadvantage so people working on aav work on post mitotic tissues like liver eye brain muscle which of course uh, uh, covers a huge plethora of diseases does that answer your question thank you my question is this they are not so what about the regulation of these yes uh it is an important question uh, it is always at the back of the mind in terms of safety perspective right currently what has happened is with the best of technologies that is available to us what we see is in term, whether it is rp65 deficiency or hemophilia you do see near physiological levels of factor 
and this is adequate in terms of maintaining the phenotype what if you have supraphysiological levels of factor 9 what if you have supraphysiological levels of rp65 thankfully you know the advancements are not at such a scale that we are there but some of the variants that we have produced we see some evidence in some animals of this one there is a natural counteracting mechanism to keep them because that is how you know we are so complex that we don't understand how complex we are we take linear view of things which is not the case because we are limited by technologies how how we can study but if there is a situation like a suicide gene where you want to regulate their expression there are many ways of doing it which we do by genetic engineering approaches if i target liver cancer i don't want this suicide gene to go into the brain then i use a liver specific promoter so then the gene expression will happen only if this constructs are within a liver cell that is one level of regulation the second level of regulation is let us assume i am doing a crispr cas9 mediated gene uh, transfer using av vectors and i want to induce the expression of the protein that i want only at specific time points then there are inducible promoters right which you can use with uh, dox inducible promoters and multiple chemo uh, 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 sensitive promoters are available so regulation is a complex as aspect but so far we are at the level where regulation has not been that very necessary except for using tissue specific promoters so, uh, also. yes we would have we would have to because at the end of the day you should not become a frankenstein's monster that you put something and then it does many things that you originally you didn't intend to see for example in uh, majority of the studies that we use one thing that i have to admit here is when you use aavs when you administer them intravenously most of the serotypes are hepatotrophic so even if i get an administration in my uh, deltoid muscle 90% of the virus that i received will end up in the liver the second level of regulation you add is a liver specific promoter so which means even if those 10 but producing factor 9 we did this that's a very very interesting question and uh, thanks for asking that question i have not talked so much about immune response because i thought uh, i have never understood immunology so i thought it's complex uh, but let me tell you so what happens typically is you administer these vectors with liver specific promoters they produce a factor 9 protein and typically what you see is after administration in mouse model or in humans between weeks 8 and 4 uh, uh, 4 and 8 1 to 2 months after gene transfer there is a peak level of protein activity factor 9 production thereafter we see a concomitant increase in liver enzymes. And when you have an con increase in liver enzymes, uh, ACPT or ACOT, it signifies an underlying activity of T cell response, particularly the CD8 mediated T cell response. And this we believe is more of a capsid specific T cell response because the majority of these capsids are targeted for destruction in the cytoplasm, like I told you. And that mounts a MNC class one and the T cell response uh, thereafter. Now, the question is, uh, you know, how can we minimize this? And what we have seen in terms of uh, dose escalation models of studies, at low doses, you don't see enough phenotypic response. Like when you use 1 trillion viral particles, 10 power 11 or 10 power 12. At 10 power 12 to 13, you see a phenotypic response, but there is a concomitant increase in liver enzymes. So the question is, how can you engineer the capsids or how can you make the vector better so at 10 power 11, you are able to achieve a phenotypic response, but staying below the radar of the T cell recognition mechanism. And that is where our capsid bioengineering approaches come in. The other way that people are tackling this in the field is when you're administering these viruses, give a low dose corticosteroid. So corticosteroid can transiently reduce the immune response. Once the virus makes it into the nucleus, the nuclear, nuclear immune surveillance mechanisms are not well developed and for a reason. Because if you have, you know, chromatin remodeling and the other thing, if you have studied that molecular biology, you do not want any immune response within the uh, nuclear compartment. So the virus is in safe zone after it enters into the nucleus. So give, docs, uh, you know, chemotherapy 
uh, with uh, low dose corticosteroids till the time they enter into the nucleus withdraw this the patient seem to be doing better Absolutely, I think you are spot on. That is always our concern. But like anything in life, there is a risk versus benefit assessment in any decision that we take personally or when you treat a patient. And uh, the idea of chemotherapy is roughly the same. The chemotherapy basically are uh, DNA uh, replication inhibitors. And they are not specific to the cancer cells. But the whole idea is the cancer has gone to such a stage, there is a benefit to be derived, even if there is systemic adverse cytotoxicity, because there are methods by which you can desiccate the patients. Right? With gene therapy, also, we follow a similar paradigm, where we say we treat with gene therapy, yes at low dose but we also have certain number of regulatory features so that you keep the dose of the vectors low combine with, with the chemotherapy and then reduce the toxicity so the whole idea is for patients who would otherwise not have any other means to survive this becomes something that they can be uh, used upon particularly in the end stage disease so it's basically a simple question of therapeutic benefit derived from maximizing the combination therapeutic approach. I wish. <laughs> uh, see, uh, again, when I talked about our research, we are mostly focused on you know deriving value to patients who have imminent disorders. But you are right. There have been some studies, uh, particularly you know, uh, uh, where gene therapy approaches have been tried for diabetes. And uh, when you give very specific genes as therapeutic cargo, while it reduces the metabolism glucose, we have also seen that the mice or the animal models that have received uh, these uh, vectors, uh, they also have better uh, 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 profile in terms of telomere shortening and uh, other aspects that relates to uh, aging process. Um, but of course, as people who are working in this field, our objective is more translational in terms of patients who need it. And this will also become important. I'm not saying that it is important, but uh, focus studies on this uh, have not been conducted majorly. Things are coming up uh, in the recent past. But in veterinary sciences, this has been used. Of course, uh, I shouldn't say whether it is good or bad, but there has been some interest on taking this to veterinary uh, for performance enhancement of animals that are used for sports and other things. It has been tried. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, see, then the concept works like this, right? So you have a missing protein function. You know the genetic etiology behind this. And you try to resurrect the pathology, uh, or you could try to overcome the pathology by delivering a normal copy of the gene. When you have a complex or multifactorial diseases, you know you do not know how many different genes you have to target to. Type two diabetes, the maturity onset diabetes of the young, which is more of a monogenic disorder, is easy to achieve. Or you need to deliver genes which has wide ranging function that broadly suppresses the phenotype, which is the effect, and not the cause. Oh, yeah, we have done it. We even using AAVs, CRISPR Cas9. I've shown you only the replacement gene therapy. We have done CRISPR Cas9. We have delivered factor 7, particularly in mouse models. What happens in mouse is when you give them too much of factor 8 or factor 9, I, as a patient or a mouse, I have never seen factor 8 or factor 9 in my life because my gene is mutated. So when I get a huge load of exogenous proteins, whether from gene therapy or protein replacement therapy, this is going to be foreign to my immune system. So I will develop antibodies against this. So what we had designed was a bypass coagulation factor in patients or in animal models that develop inhibitors. You can administer this 70 that can bypass the requirement of factor 8 and 9 by CRISPR-Cas9 mediated gene therapy. This has been done with AV. This has been done with lentivirus in CAR T cell therapies. 
uh, integration is required. So, right. See, um, if you look at the literature, typically it is meant to be only one copy. Uh, because, for example, if you do a mouse experiment, you it's a targeted integration because you will be using specific guide RNA against the ROSA 26 loci, or in humans, it is the AVS19 loci against which generally they are considered to be safe harbor. And uh, majority of the publications you will see are talking about only one copy integration. Uh, but we have seen non targeted integration of these copies in multiple other hot sites. But they generally do not typically uh, disrupt the active genes. They are in the non-coding regions of the gene. So our own data shows that. But in terms of copy at the exact copy, in terms of uh, at the designated site, we have seen typically in our studies at least one copy. Yeah, so uh, this is to be expected, right? See, if you are reconstituting a function of the gene which that animal model or uh, patient has never seen before, the feedback mechanism is going to take some time to uh, come towards it, right? And uh, there are not pointed studies in terms of coagulation disorders. But in ocular disorders, we do see uh, certain other feedback mechanisms that are lacking, right? And uh, uh, at the molecular level, we see, but at the phenotype level, it doesn't manifest because any auto feedback loop is well regulated within the normal physiology. And the patients have a defect only in terms of this particular protein. They are normal for everything else. See, I'll give you one example. Take uh, the case of hemophilia, right? You have a patient with hemophilia B who lacks factor IX. You have delivered AAV based factor IX to increase the function. And they form the fibrin clot and they reconstitute the factor IX levels. Now, this is pro coagulation pathway. If you see, when you cut your hand, the bleeding stops, arrest, but you also see that the wound heals because there are fibrinolytic factors, right? Otherwise, you cannot have only procoagulation in circulating blood, then you will form clots anywhere and everywhere. So that has to be regulated. But the moment I reconstitute factor nine level in an animal model on this, the every other component seems to be working equally well, right? And uh, there is a adaptation that is required for the animal that has received gene therapy in terms of bringing in normal physiology in terms of the fibrinolytic system, these have been worked out with cellular models, but typically this is not long. Any other questions from the students? So by the way, I just wanted to tell you, uh, so uh, IIT Kanpur uh, has a big uh, bioengineering and biological sciences department. And in addition to that, we are starting a med school uh, PG uh, med school with 500 beds and um, uh, anybody who is interested in any sort of help whether you would like to do a project there you are looking for positions there or if you want uh, you me to connect to a very specific faculty I'll be happy to help and my email ID is J A Y R A O J Rao at the rate of iitk.ac.in if you type my name in google i think you may get it also if you go to our department website i'll be happy to facilitate anything that you would like to uh, uh, get from iit kanpur uh, in terms of your work thank you We are thankful to Ross sir for his uh, lecture, which really inspired us because uh, most of people and the students might not knowing about the gene therapy. I think we need many more lectures about it so that we can uh, get more information about it. And any scientists concerned with the topic uh, would like to work. Ross is always uh, with open hands for that. 
i hope so uh, next time uh, we will uh, like to have many more lectures from sir about other things also and in the hopeful meantime we would like to have collaborations not only for the level of scientific uh, fraternity together but uh, break mou between the it kanpur which we which will we'll just have a talk regarding that and at when the vice chancellor will come and we like to proceed in ahead for that i hope so students any time if you feel so to contact sir on the email you can contact and maybe in the future we'll have some series of lectures online for the same issue or any other uh, work which sir is going to promote thanks a lot from everyone uh, for joining us here and one picture we like to outside <laughs> the petal so that a member of remembrance thanks very much thank you very much thank you dr sokin i would love to be here uh, but please tell me when the sun is not out uh, <laughs> last week <laughs> i didn't miss kanpur when then <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but it is wonderful to be here you know uh, if we were in a situation like this all our lab meetings daily meetings will happen outside <laughs> wonderful to be here
Thank you. 